Welcome to the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the exploration and cultivation of the outside genius found in neurodivergence. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast. My name is Lillian Skinner. Today I am going to go over an interview that I did with Dr. Linda Silverman, a profoundly gifted researcher and the founder of the Gifted Development Center in Colorado. I did this interview on the 13th and my microphone broke. I can't really hear Dr. Silverman. There is no interview on her side and so therefore I can't put it up. But or I did sit through this interview with her. She did send me her notes afterwards, which were pretty close to what we did talk about in the interview, with the exception of three minor things. And I decided, well, I did this interview, so I am going to give it to you. I'm going to put in the show notes her notes, and I'm going to just go through again what we talked about, because this is a very important interview. Dr. Linda Silverman is very important. She's very important to me because she is the person who allowed me to have enough security to come on and do this podcast. Without her, there would be no podcast because I was raised in a family of people who had to hide who they were. And I was beaten as a child so that I would know that I could never really be myself. When I finally found somebody who said to me that I wasn't insane and I wasn't making this stuff up and that I actually was who I said I was, uh, that was all I needed. I just basically needed an invitation to not not go to the funny farm or get out of jail free card, if you want to call it. And that is what Dr. Linda Silverman gave me. She validated me. She said, this is part of my profound giftedness and this is real. And I didn't really know why, but this interview did actually give me a huge clue. And it's an interesting one because I'm on a journey right now that I don't know the final destination of, but I do know what direction I'm going. I do know a little bit more each day. And the reason there's no destination is because the world that we know is going away. It doesn't exist anymore. We have to be realistic. We have to prepare for that. Now, our society has taken resources from the future to create the world we're in today. And we have known that this would end up blowing up in our faces. We've known since the 70s. And we're right on track. We're actually early. And we're going towards a really not so great future. And the only people that are going to survive it are those who are aware of themselves and can get back with in touch with their sensing and navigate new. Because we have been all put in sort of an artificial world, a society that that made things stable, but then sort of took the the fear and the danger and made it into work. So that most of us are being oppressed and we have, we have very little autonomy to figure out who we are because we're being forced into it. And my family is so extreme, they're such outliers, they're such gifted neurodivergence that had to beat us very young in order for us to understand that there was no way that you were going to escape from this. There was no way that you were going to actually ever figure out yourself. And I grew up with that knowledge and when I finally was given a door out of it, I took it. And this is the result. So when I sat down with Dr. Linda Silverman, I really wanted to know how the spatial giftedness manifested, how she really saw what we were talking about, because she has many, many things that she researches, but the spatial giftedness is the thing that I've sort of taken up as a mantle and really run with. And so when I first sat down with her, my first question was, how have you seen spatial giftedness manifest? Because I have taken it a lot further than most people would ever dare. (laughs) But this is how my brain sees it. This is how I manifest it. And she said right out of the gate, you know, I don't see it the same way you do. I don't see it the same way. I see it as right and left brain hemisphere, not conscious subconscious. And I understand that. The reason I don't say right and left is because right and left is somewhat controversial. Some people say that's not true and it's been disproven. Other people say it isn't. But I still have to go back to my story about the boy who has born with 2% of the brain and it grew to 80%. So we do have massive plasticity in our brain. We do have massive variation. My MRI scans and such show up as fairly normal. I don't think my brain looks that exceptionally different. 
I do have a large cerebellum and I also have a large amygdala, which is a sign of autism. It's one of those things that goes with that. So there is some slight difference in mine. It isn't that much different that I should be the outlier that I am. I do think that it's interesting when she's talking about right and left brain. And, and she said that she sees that most of this is right hemisphere. What I'm talking about spatial gifted is all right hemisphere. I am equal right and left brain thinking. I am a highly logical person. I do not have the imagination that two of my children have. I have the imagination that my middle kid has, who's a logic person. She's a math kid. My other two kids who are humanities, they have a very fantastic fantasy life going. And I don't have that yet. My gift is on that that right hemisphere side, according to Dr. Silverman. And I find that interesting because I have a highly logical brain. I did tech. I was forced into being, you know, sort of the parent of the household. And I don't know if that changed it for me or if I was always going to be like this, but there is something different in that the right and left brain for me are pretty equal. And she says, you know, the right hemisphere has major involvement in creativity, imagination, intuition, empathy, mathematical and scientific interests, big picture thinking in all fields, thinking outside the box, the ability to predict, predict trends, understanding the customer's needs, uh, design, fine arts, photographic memory, spiritual awareness, the ability to grasp non-duality, which is LGBTQ. We don't have to have somebody be a male or a female. That's sort of irrelevant. And I'm one of those people. I go by they, them, because I don't particularly concern myself with sexuality. I present very feminine, but my know that I have an autistic male brain. So, you know, that's, that's a real thing. And then psychic ability, which technically I have psychic ability. I've talked to the most high level of natural talent, but I don't really know that I think I have psychic ability. For me, this is a very logical thing. It's very spatially gifted. And I know that I have a weird position. My brain is very balanced and I don't have that feeling of oneness. I don't know about Jung's collective conscious. Now I asked her how many areas does spatial giftedness manifest and she wrote countless. I believe it. those of us with higher sensing, it's the laying down of layers of understanding of all that complexity of more than 2D. I don't think anybody's actually a 2D thinker. I think that most of us are conditioned into 2D thinking. We have B.F. Skinner and his behaviorism and he's very much about pushing on us and molding us into something that's useful for society. I cannot tell you if it's an extreme version of what that that makes the gifted neurodivergent. We're almost so molded by our environment that we actually have to create our own way or if we are the complete opposite and we have from the beginning. The reason I say this is I come from a family of savants. They all have a lot of talent and they're all really broken and somehow for some reason I'm not. And I don't really fit the mold of the logic math person or the music person or the the emotions person but i definitely have the emotions gifts and i have the math logic brain but i don't enjoy math and i don't particularly enjoy music comparatively to my enjoyment of people i am definitely focused on people when she talks about countless i mean i do see countless of ways that this can manifest i can see basically in almost an infinite level but it really is not so much about how we are manifesting it like, oh, this is so amazing. It's just sort of like the different variations of ability to understand, comprehend, see the world around us, the people around us, the things we do ourselves. It's it's a complexity. And I know that my giftedness is really much in understanding myself, how I move through the world and then showing other people. And when other people sit across from me and we go back and forth, I learn about myself as much as I learn about them because they are giving me new ways of seeing. We're so rare that we actually don't get proper mirroring out in the world. It's really important for someone who's a massive outlier to understand what other massive outliers, how they move through the world. It's very important. Otherwise, we're going to be lost. We're never going to fully develop. We won't heal from our trauma because if we do not have self-awareness, if we don't know what we're supposed to be and who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to be it, and especially if our destiny is more driven by the the places we're born into, the world, the way the world's going, that's going to be much more vague. It's not going to be as clear. So our journey is going to be unique and really going to be based on what we're knowing. And I sit across from people every day and we talk about being prompt driven. And I think that this is basically what it is to be a gifted neurodivergent. You are prompt driven. Everything about you is requiring inputs from the outside. I'm coming back 
around to do this interview that I had with her, I've had a couple weeks to think about it because I've had to fix things. It's been fascinating to actually sit in this last couple weeks thinking about what she had said and how does it apply and what did it mean? Because there was a couple times in my interview that she threw me for a curve. I generally always know what's going to happen next. And then somebody tells me something. I'm like, wait, is that right? I didn't see it that way. And she did. She threw me twice for a curve. And I'll talk about that as we get further in. I asked her, what's the highest and low manifestation? Because she told me that math, music, and emotions were the three areas that profound giftedness presented in. And those are the three areas my family savant gifts present in. So what does that look like at the highest level? And she said, well, in mathematics, the highest manifestation is about grasping mathematics of the universe, sort of being able to see how the world comes together like Einstein. And I can easily see that how this is done because I have a math savant in my house and I can see how she can see that. I can see it a little bit, but not, not nearly as clearly as she can. But it is fascinating because she definitely has that manifestation of grasping the mathematics of the universe because she can see patterns that clearly in nature. The lowest though might be just simple numbers and counting, enjoying it like a little kid does, liking sorting and adding up. In music, it might be the ability to compose inspiring music. The lowest might just be appreciation of music. The interesting thing about her music was that in my family, the music, we can compose those, but it's more than just the ability to compose. It's actually this drive to create our own. And I know for myself, just like the math and the music, I have this need to do it my way. I have taken guitar and cello lessons for most of my childhood, and I taught myself piano, and I've taught myself a bunch of other instruments. And when I play my instruments as an adult, and I'm, I'm free and I don't have other people driving me, I play them because I enjoy them. I play them because I want them. I create what I want. I may recreate other people's songs, but they're never the way they created them. They're my own way. And I do not really feel like making my own music other than on synthesizers and, and things that I can shortcut. Because for me, it is the act of making it the easiest way that I get a lot of pleasure out of. But I don't really have a burning desire to release it and share it with people. I just enjoy making it for me because it helps me find flow. So I think that the highest one may actually be the need to make it yourself and not follow those of others. It is an absolute need to create beautiful and pleasing sounds. The emotion side, she said, the ability to deeply feel what others are feeling is the highest and the lowest would be the ability to, to direct it compassionately. And for me, I can feel what other people are feeling hands down, but I think I, I can actually take it further than that. I can actually see using their emotion, how they feel, I can think like them. I can think and I can see what they're gonna do in the future. I can predict what their likely choices are. It kind of freaks the people out, it kind of freaks me out. It's also the lowest might be just emotional intensity without the ability to direct it compassionately. I think that's interesting because actually I think there's a lot of autistic people out there. My father's one of them. And there are probably a lot of neurodivergence in general out there who have a lot of emotion. There's high and intense emotion in autism. And I wrote a post on it just recently, writing this post about how we see overwhelm in the wrong way. We don't understand the value of it, but it has a really distinct value. The value is, is that it's bringing data, transferring it between our subconscious and our conscious or our long-term memory or short-term memory or, or our conscious. When something goes wrong, like it was with this microphone, when it went wrong, I was in despair. This is the most important interview I'm doing so far in my life, and it screws up. I have mechanical error for it. Why me? But in that emotion, up came the reason that it broke. Up came the reason <laughs> that, that it occurred. And so I was able to fix it. This had happened with my co-host in my the, the Child podcast. I noticed this when I was editing her part of the podcast. thought she was actually manually doing this, but this is actually something the software was doing, and I don't know how she enabled it, and I don't think she knows how she enabled it, and I don't know how I enabled it or didn't enable it, but either way, it muted the person I was talking to, and that was not cool, but at least I know what happened. I At least I know how to fix it, and I really had no concept, but that high emotion sort of connected a bunch of dots and gave me the answer and I was able to go figure that out. It's too late to fix that interview. Dr. Silverman's really hard to get a, I was supposed to meet with her in May and it, it ended up being December. And I've known her maybe three years and each year I have a single meeting with her and it takes the whole year for that meeting to come about because she's 
very busy. She has an incredible amount of things going on in her calendar. I, I'm lucky to get a chance to talk to her. I could see the resolution in my emotions. And when I have those strong emotions, that really high emotions, I have this giant epiphany. I was saying in my post on LinkedIn, we're missing what overwhelms purpose is. That overwhelm is saying, okay, you're taking in so much and, and bringing it in, but it's the brain saying, I'm storing all this stuff. And then if you want it later, you have to bring up those same emotions. So I'm able to bring up solutions and epiphanies in my blind rage, in my utter despair, in my worst feelings. I think that might be the thing that she's talking about with the highest manifestation and the lowest manifestation. But for me, I have both the highest and lowest because I have emotional intensity and it's not about directing it compassionately. I really, I really cannot necessarily help it because when something comes up that's profound, it comes up with so much emotion, I am leveled. I think the best example is the move IT guy from Saturday Night Live back in the day where he would be so frustrated like, ugh, ugh. but it is probably that that person is representing somebody who's highly intelligent, who's highly emotional because our emotions and our intellect are connected and we have a system that actually makes us pay for that. I I have to have my emotions in order for my full understanding of situations to come up and that frustration that IT people have when they're trying to work with people and the information they're getting is partial and it doesn't actually make any logical sense and they're saying I never touched the keyboard or I don't know it just broke that's not true so up comes up this frustration that's saying ah, but also it's bringing up with it all the patterns that that broke so there's a perfect example of why all the IT's are neurodivergent because it's new when they have that that sort of subconscious like understanding but then also that it's in a highly emotional person that has that level of intellect, has that sort of way of moving through the world, and they need that emotion, and we, we end up condemning them for it. Our brains are fascinating, and we really don't know that much about them because we've decided to not know that much about them, and I would like to change that. Then I talked to her about life-changing aspects of spatial abilities. She said that visual spatials are innate, and they're like just sort of a part of our giftedness, and she believes that they're, they're kind of a path. Like you are born with these gifts and you move through them. And I already told you that I'm not so sure that that's true. I know that mine sort of is a hybrid of the savants in my family. And I definitely have that emotional side, but I also have that extreme logical side. And so I think that there's something that's going on that also changes us. And she says, we are capable of going beyond duality. We're likely to forge unusual lifestyles. We're not going to be the norms of society. We're just going to be many, many things. We have sharp intuitive abilities. <laughs> and she says it makes us excellent salesperson. And she talked about how she wants actually these spatial abilities. She wants somebody to replace her leading her practice, the Gifted Development Center, who is an intuitive therapist, somebody who is highly in touch with their intuition. And that won't be me because I don't have a therapy degree. That means she's probably talking about someone out there listening. She's looking for someone like us to replace her. So if you are an intuitive therapist and you're interested in gifted people and, and this is your profession or this is something you want to go into, you know, maybe it's a time to, to write her a letter and, and let her know that you're interested because she's amazing and very young and energetic, but she's in her 70s. And we went on to talk about how her big picture thinking, how her generation had big picture. And we talked about Peter Levine and we talked about Lita Hollingworth, her mentor, the person that she first read and felt, yes, this is right. I know this is right. And she says that we've lost that big picture. We're, we're too down in the details. And we've gone down these forks that have led us to where we are today. We're not really necessarily serving people. We're not necessarily really seeing how they all come together. We're not really less freeing them. And she was incredibly kind about the way she said it. We both agreed that people like Peter Levine, I loved his book, Waking the Tiger on Trauma. And he, she said, he is a perfect example, brilliant man. And I think there's a, many from her generation that had that big picture and were able to, to come in and, and really understand and change things. But that is, that's gone. I can't even get into the system with my big picture. When I applied to graduate school, I was told... I was kind of laughed at, basically, and I nobody's interested in my my perspective. It's not detailed enough, and it's not gonna 
push the science and it's really huge. Like I probably should have been born a hundred years ago because I'm, I'm of the wrong space. But then again, maybe I'm supposed to be born right now because my big picture is maybe guides us as we hit the collapse. So the next part we talked about was what were my first indications that things were not as the education and medical system said they were? The medical system does not even see me. I went for my autism diagnosis and I had to go several times because I kept getting diagnosed as, as a narcissist. I'm not a narcissist. They just wouldn't land on it. Despite me having a multitude of comorbidities, the medical system just wouldn't hear me because I came in and said, I think I have autism. These are the reasons why I have epilepsy. I have a Chiari malformation. I went through all these lists and it was almost as if because I came in saying, I'm pretty sure I have this, and it was still early before most people who were high functioning were really getting diagnosed with it, but I knew because of my father and my sister, and I knew that we were savants and I wanted to try to like go into this and understand it more, but I just kept getting declared a narcissist because our system doesn't see big picture savants. It doesn't see savantism outside idiot savants. And so therefore, the only person who would show up and do this is a narcissist. And that was disheartening. And I still have to go through this half the time when I go to the doctors. I have to get misdiagnosed. And I know about myself. I read up on these things. And they every time have to let me know I don't know myself. And, you know, that's that's offensive. <laughs> So, so I asked about this and she said one of her first memories was when she was around four. She was hearing her older sister like kind of yelling at her parents like, well, it's your fault. I'm this way. You know, I didn't ask to be born. You made me this way. And she said at four, she knew that that couldn't be. She knew that she was wrong. And she said, you know, I, I knew right then and there we, we create our own destiny. We create our own realities. We we are the makers of the place we are, the makers of ourselves. And she said at 19, she married a man who became a psychic healer. She lived with miracles. Education is competitive. And there's these viewpoints and giftedness that are really competitive. And she has always believed that each of us has sort of like a, a, a goal, a reason for being here, a unique mission. And the gifted don't compete. And that's definitely for me. I'm not interested in competing. I am interested in making my own thing. It's like I want to know what other people are doing, but I don't feel like competing with them. I, I'm i interested in making my own path. I'm interested in making a path so other people can make theirs. That's what really I am. It's like, I will clear this, this pathway so that others can use my path to make their own. She's found actually with medicine and doctors, there's a lot of it being just sort of risk-based. Everything's about fear. This could happen wrong and this could happen wrong. And I have to say, I agree. My father was a paramedic when I was growing up and he was constantly giving us the worst case scenario for anything that could go wrong. Our whole head was going to explode. If we were sick, it was, oh, they had Kenox purpura instead of a sore throat. I have to agree with her. I do think that we'd focus on the negative. They don't actually think that you could be an outlier. They don't think that it's going to be something that has to do with sensitivity. I mean, especially for me, I have lots of, of comorbidities with my autism and I grew up and they were constantly trying to make it into something that I need to take medication for, I need to do this for, but it was never really simple like, oh, you're really sensitive and you should look at your schedule. They never look at schedule. It is very risk-based and I think it just serves the whole system and their need to keep us in the schedule at no matter what the cost. Now she doesn't say that, that's my interpretation, but she was saying that it is very risk-based and that you know we, we kind of keep people alarmed. And I'm like, yeah, and that other part. Capitalism really does run on selling things. It's selling what you're doing. It's selling what you are what you see in the world. And if you can get people to feel emotional about it, it's a much easier sell. So doctors and medicine have really done taken up the, the mantle of risk and fear and protecting and keeping people like in the box. And I have experienced that with all of the ridiculous things I've been told about myself that weren't true. They were just that I'm an outlier. She wants us to get to the place where we finally get the understanding of the mind and body connection. And I agree. I think that we have a massive mind body connection. I know for me, my mind and body do tend to work as one. And I, I'm an outlier for that. I'm an extreme weirdo for that. And that's a sad thing because everybody's body is going to have to tend to work as one as we move through the chaos that's going to be our future. We're all going to need to be in touch with our sensing. 
And that's kind of why I'm doing this because I need to figure this out. I need to figure out why my body does this and nobody else seems to do it or why very few others do it. And I need to figure out why I don't fit into the spiritual world, nor do I fit into the the system world. It's I'm somewhere in the middle and there's a reason for that. I'm supposed to be in the middle and I'm supposed to figure it out. And I am a product of what, she, what her thought process is. And that's why she probably supported me. The self-motivated journey she went on is where she went today. So while she believes everybody has a, a mission, she very much doesn't believe that she was self-motivated. She she felt it was a calling. And she called. She was called for it when she was 17. And she believes she's continuing the work of Lita Stutter Hollingsworth, who passed away shortly after she was born. But there were many, many connections between them, even their stubby thumbs. <laughs> and I... I don't know that I have that. I think she's lucky. I'm glad that she has a mentor. Even though the mentor wasn't there for her physically, the mentor was there for her emotionally. And there, her books out there really connected with her. And that's fantastic. I, I hope to find that someday. What surprised her most on the journey? Well, she said she was shocked that the testing industry actually listened to her. It was least surprised that the competitive achievement mindset of the field suddenly persists. When I first met her, she had mentioned that she was she had the most data of anybody in the world on profound gift, profoundly gifted children, and yet they still didn't listen to her, really only into the last, I mean, 10 or so years. And that was, you know, that was a huge change. She said before, she, she kept putting out data and more and more data and they didn't listen to her but now now they're starting to listen and i mean times are changing they they realize that they need creativity they realize they need the gift of people who are the extreme outlier gifted and so people are looking at her data but it wasn't convenient when it first came out so i'm sure that they they weren't looking at it and she's very kind much kinder than i am because i i believe that we were we're actively oppressed on purpose I asked her, how are empathy and intuition connected with the development of spatial giftedness? And she said, visual spatial abilities, empathy and intuition are all connected with the right hemisphere, which we talked about in the beginning. She says, I don't see any of them developing, but rather they're innate. Individuals with high visual spatial abilities can manifest their abilities in endless ways from like flower arrangements to life devoted to service, but it's still an innate thing. We need space and we need knowledge about ourselves because we've been denied who we are so there, there is some cultivation in the sense that I think that we need to understand how creative intelligence is, and we have to go into that, because there are a lot of talent in this world that we don't even recognize. And I mean, I come from that family, and it, it drives you insane when your talent goes unrecognized. I have musical savants in my family who went through the system and were told that they were cheating because they could play by ear. They're not musicians as a result. They were destroyed by that. So. I would say almost that what we actually need is, that's why I say space, is we need acceptance, space, and a little bit of self-knowledge, a little bit of cultivation, and we can start running. But we are supposed to create unique paths. And as a result, you, you need somebody to say, yes, I need, you need somebody like, what Linda gave me was, you know, hey, you can do this and be safe. I didn't have to worry about my, my well-being or my being like it put into an insane asylum. That was what I had to worry about. So with, with, other people, I imagine it's going to be similar. They need the space to believe that they have the gift they have and to work on it and, and help people reflect them and understand them. But it doesn't have to be nearly this formal education. The formal education, we naturally have these gifts that they can't, you're kind of born with, but there is some cultivation. There's the space to learn mm -hmm. and the downtime. They steal that from us in the system. They steal the downtime to learn who we are. I'm definitely having to develop this. My brain wants to understand it, my brain wants to, to go into it, but it's it's sort of like an, a flowering unfolding as far as how I'm going on this path. It's like every day I'm going into it and it's, it is a calling in a way in the sense that I know that I'm supposed to do this, I'm not exactly sure why, I know that it's going to be needed, I know that we're going down these paths and these things are gonna roll out and I have a very, I have a clear picture of of why they're needed, but I don't actually have a clear picture of exactly how they'll be used. So I'm constantly working at that. I'm constantly working to make my, my intuition fully recognize cognition. And she believes that this is sort of a, 
like a journey that you get picked and you're pulled on. And, and I, I don't have that. And maybe it's because I don't have anybody that I have a book from. Maybe I don't have a mentor. Maybe I don't get one. I don't know. What is the, my next question was, what is the connection between spatial giftedness and the higher levels of empathy and intuition? She sees it as spiritual. She was married to a spiritual healer, so that makes sense, or a psychic healer. That makes sense. She believes in the full oneness of the universe and the empathy and stronger and the, the greater your empathy and the stronger your intuition. She sees these abilities all from the right hemisphere awareness of all that is. And again, this is a weird thing for me because I have these abilities and I don't know that I understand them because when I go into the world that that they're there, I don't fit into that world. And I know part of it's just that I don't do the processes to get up there. My brain is already doing them. But I also find that they have all these processes that involve energies and all of these things. And mine's just very clear. It's just emotions. If I just feel the emotions of another person, I can think like them and I can see what they'll do and I can see what they've done. And I can do this for people I've never met. I can do it in the past and I can do it in the future. And it's my perspective taking is so large. It's like a, a viewfinder where I have a million different little views I can put in and look through everybody that ever existed and everybody that will. And I don't, I don't know why. And I didn't, I didn't ask for this. And I also didn't cultivate it. it. It was kind of there, but I'm trying to figure it out because according to the literature, I'm not supposed to do it the way I do it. And I also don't understand what's the purpose of it. Because the spiritual world doesn't necessarily give me the purpose that I know I have. It's not the one that they're saying. It's different. And I'm kind of still searching for the full manifestation and full understanding of how this was valuable. So I asked her about my two types of intuition, like the intrinsic and extrinsic, because I do believe that part of what motivates me is that I am extremely intrinsic. Like you cannot, I mean, this is why my parents really were so tough with the, my, you know, my dad's family was so brutal with their punishment for the kids who were like me, my sister and I, and not so much for my other siblings who were more, they were moderately gifted because they had to make sure that we, we knew that we weren't allowed to do intrinsic. We had to be extrinsic. And it was really hard for me. My brain gets tired out on extrinsic. My brain wants to do what's inside of it really bad. It wants to figure out the world. It wants to figure out those patterns. And this is why I pulled my middle kid out because she couldn't figure out the patterns in school. She was never going to learn much anything at all. She learns it all fine at home. She takes classes online and she pursues interests of her own. And she's always building something. She's always growing. She's always blowing me away with what she knows. And my older two... They're people oriented. So the school is almost like ancillary. Like it really is about them learning the people and their classmates and such. So that is that is a fascinating thing. The thing I had to focus on more with my oldest and my youngest is that I had to heal them. And that's why they came out of school. Um, I asked her, you know, do you think that intrinsic motivation, like which builds passion and giftedness, is there an inverse relationship? Which is what I was asking about. Like, do you see this where people who are really, you know, forced to be extrinsic is actually maybe the maker of our, of our insanity, of the mental illness. Because I do believe that forcing people, denying them their reality and forcing them to be something they're not meant to be because they don't, they are high sensing and they move through the world in an organic way. And we force them into a path that doesn't let them do that. And they have to work under people and they're constantly being told that there's wrong and forced to look inside. I do believe that's the maker of the mental illness. That's what causes so much pain for people. And we have brains that will not break as easily as average. The whole military and school systems are there to sort of break us, to break our brains and then rebuild them up so that we're good soldiers, we're good workers, we're good people who listen and follow directions and are good little molded people. But I, I'm not good at that. I'm really bad at it, actually. I have to put everything in my power. I have to hurt myself. I have to injure my psyche. I have to injure my body and physically to, to maintain focus because it exhausts me so much to stay in my extrinsic what you want me to focus on. I need to focus on what I want to focus on. And when I am allowed to, I have super focus. And it's amazing. I can go all day. I can create. I can constantly put out. But a lot of it's done in my head. And so when I'm working for other people doing what they want to do, 
I'm miserable and I sit across from clients every day who are like that. And my goal to, when I work with people is for us to figure out what your giftedness is, what your innate sort of path is, and then how do we sandwich that into the world? And that's what I do. And if you have to come and we have to build something for you and you're going to end up being a coach in my network that I want to like build or my community I want to build, then that would be what it is. But I will make sure that it gets built because that's my goal is to free us. And then she said something. She saw intrinsic motivation as entelechy. So the purpose, a supposed vital principle that guides the development and functioning of an organism in either system or organization. Entelechy. Entelechy is the future calling you. It's you having sort of an innate knowledge of where you're going to go and you having a purpose and you fulfilling that purpose. And there's a link between trauma and neurodivergence I asked her about and she said she doesn't know but it'd be a really great fruitful research project. And I, that was kind of loop she threw me for because I was like, huh, why don't I want to do this? Like I would have picked this up if I wanted it and I really don't feel any desire to do it. It's definitely not my special interest. But I realized the reason why I know so much about it is I've literally read every freaking thing I could get my hand on for my entire life on trauma, trying to understand why my trauma was so up in front and center when I was going through it. And other people would just sit there like, okay, and their trauma would manifest later. I wanted to know what was wrong with me. Well, I, there's nothing wrong with me. My, my trauma manifests there. My brain comes in and says, hey, this is going down and this isn't okay. And you should get the heck out of here. And it's, it's almost like I have a higher level of self-protection than most people, like a much higher level of self-protection. And our system is not healthy and it's not really that good for us. It is captivity. And the autistic people, we tend to be very aware of this. Maybe not cognitively, but our bodies are surely aware. And my brain, my brain is very much aware of it cognitively. It has messages coming up all the time, screaming, this person is going to screw you over. This person is out, not out for your good. And I struggle in this world because we celebrate psychopaths and we celebrate people who screw other people. And I have been screwed out of bonuses. I have been screwed out of money left and right. I have been lied to and cheated in my professional career. And I worked for large corporations that were, you know, supposed to be above board and we recognize them as wonderful places to work and they were horrible they were they were constantly trying to cheat me they're constantly trying to get me to put more time in and then they would screw me out of a bonus or there's always something that they're trying to mess around with you and then we have a friend that is getting screwed out of his federal government pension right now and he's got like six months left to his 20 years and there's so many people that i know that are kind of going through something similar and our, our society's like, eh, oh well. But that's a horrible thing. How can I go into a world and put my heart and soul into it and do a good job when I can see that this be these people are not out for me in any sort of fair manner, that they're out to extract from me the benefit that they can get to the extreme degree and give me the least amount? That's not kind. That's not collaboration. That's what's making the world destroyed. Now, she talked about I should go into this and I should research it. I, I already know what it is. I already know the link. And I think that the thing with trauma is like, I know that it has affected me. I know that it has changed my body. I know that it has stored so many things in my brain that come up with such ferocity and then tell me and protect me because that's what I've run into so much in my lifetime. But she believes that we are an evolution. We're the future and neurodivergence are being born and we're becoming more neurodivergent to survive what's coming. I don't know that, that I agree with that. Because I have a family of savants, and they've always been this talented. They've always had these gifts, and they've gone insane. And the reason I'm here today and not insane is because they've opened up the information floodgates, and I am using my higher sensing to navigate that. But my parents didn't have it. My dad and his dad and his my uncle and my other family members that are savants, they didn't have it, and they... They're crazy. They lost their mind. They were horrible parents. They were horrible spouses. They aren't, they didn't turn out well and they were insane and they're broken for it. And they are those emotionally people who can't control their emotions and take them out on the weakest people. So I think that we are having more neurodivergence come up because we have a more traumatizing environment rather than this is the evolution. I think that this is just a natural part of our adaption, which, you know, may be evolution, but I, I actually don't know that it's evolution. It's just our bodies and brains being flexible. It's being plastic. And of course, the neurodivergents are the most plastic. We know that. And that's why that's there. But I don't 
want to take away from her her belief because her belief system is much more <laughs> widely entrenched than mine. I mean, mine I'm creating right now and hers is hers is a part of a, a system that her husband brought into her life with his being a psychic healer and and I'm not in that world. So mine is based on me and the particular way I move through the world. Um, but she really does believe that we are the future and that it is our neurodivergence that's going to survive if anybody's going to survive the future. And in that part, we most certainly agree. And that was my interview with Dr. Silverman. She did mention one other thing that threw me for a loop. She mentioned that when she was talking about her sister, I said, well, you know, when you when you find your own way, isn't that just positive disintegration? And she goes, disintegration. And she said, no, Lillian, you've never integrated. And I was like, what? And I had to think about it. And I had to think and think and think and think on it. But I realized it's not that I didn't integrate. Because I didn't integrate into society. But I did integrate into my family. I mean, I, I had to leave my parents and not talk to them anymore. Because my parents were... My brain had wrapped around their needs so much that I didn't exist in my family. I didn't, I couldn't ask for my needs. I still can't ask for my needs because when I get around my parents, my brain wants to take care of them so much and make sure that their pain is gone so that I can be free of their pain because I am so wired to their emotions and I feel them in my body stronger than I feel my own. And so I had to leave them and go off on my own path. And that was part of this too, is that I may not have integrated into society, but I integrated so fully into my family where I lost myself. And that's why I talk about Echoists, because we have this giftedness that literally makes it so that you are, you lose you, you're gone, you don't find yourself. And the way to find you back is for you to figure out yourself and give yourself the space to do that development you didn't get to do when you were trapped in that family with so many needs. You know, if you're if you're the scapegoat in your family, you didn't develop the way you should have, and you're miserable, and it's because of that. And that's my opinion. That's my opinion. But that's why I will not be researching project on trauma because I already have this trauma, and I've I've already healed from my trauma, and my trauma was healed by the big picture. It was healed by understanding, having context, and going into the information, and going on that journey. And that's why I believe we're either the most extreme version of Skinner's behaviorism, where our entire prompt-driven world and life is molding us at such a greater degree because we take in so many more inputs than the actual school systems. Whereas average, the school systems can override what their natural state is. But this would actually tie into the the indigenous people being geniuses that so many researchers will talk about how they're all so they they're so brilliant, they have novel thought, they're you know, they move through the world with just sort of this innate knowing. That's because they're they're open to that. They're open to that innate knowing. They're open to their intuition. They're open to their learning as they go and patterns. And our society turns that off in us. And in order for us to get through the next transition of out of society and survive, we're going to have to turn that back on. And that's what I'm trying to do. So that was my interview with Dr. Silverman. If you believe that you're profoundly gifted and you would like to go for her assessment, I highly recommend it. I did not go for it because I didn't really need to I also, I did contact Intergifted, which is like the international one, and I didn't find them as, as valuable as I found Dr. Silverman's. I do recommend her, and she's in the States if you're in the States. That was how that worked. But I think that if you're questioning and you're unsure, the Gifted Development, or Development Center in Colorado, Dr. Linda Silverman, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. I hope this was of value. Take care, everyone. The views, information, and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent Gifted NT Incorporated, Lillian Skinner, or the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast. This podcast, Lillian Skinner, and Gifted NT Incorporated are not responsible and do not verify the accuracy of the information contained in this podcast series. The primary purpose of this podcast is to inform and educate. The Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast is only available for private, non-commercial use. Any other use of the information contained within this podcast must be done with express written approval and knowledge of Lillian Skinner. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute any part of this podcast. The developer assumes no liability for this podcast or its use on any other podcast or other media.